Uh, I'm Charles Traub. I'm the chairperson of the Photography, Video, Related Media Program, School of Visual Arts. Most of you know me. Uh, and I seem to know a lot of people here. So thank you all for coming. Um, we're very excited to have Bonnie Yogelson, one of the founding faculty members of our department, uh, lecturing on a subject that is most dear, I think, to all of us because I think there is no photography in the realm that we all are most interested in without Stieglitz. Uh, certainly he was the foundation of my learning. Uh, first paper I ever did on in humanities graduate program was on Stieglitz in New York, by the way, uh -huh. uh, about the uh, Flatiron Building and about that's not this picture, the other one, and about the steerage. So that was 1967, so he's been with me a long time. Bonnie's been with us uh, a short time at SVA, uh, really part and parcel of everything that the MFA photography department, video department, has done over the last, I hate to say it, 23 years. Um, Bonnie has contributed to the history component of our department, to the critical department, to admissions department, to <laughs> most importantly, and I think probably in the most difficult curatorial task that she has and has had in a long career of curating many shows, she has to curate the thesis show every year, uh, a task of managing uh, rather remarkable people, but people who've never been managed before. So. I think you all know that Bonnie is a curator, uh, former head of the Department of Prints and Photography at the Museum of the City in New York. She's done books on, on Carl Struess, on, on uh, Bernice Abbott, on White, Clarence White, uh, an indefatigable historian, writer, and uh, in fact, thinker about our medium. Bonnie, thank you for doing this, and thank you for a wonderful show and anybody hasn't seen it needs to trundle down to the uh, Seaport Museum. Uh, it's a remarkable show, and uh, it's uh, very dimensional. Uh, by the way, I'd like to thank the people from the museum for supporting Bonnie, and uh, the staff and people of the School of Visual Arts, uh, Beatrice Gross, our creative interlocutor, who arranged all of this, and Rob Barton, and the staff up there. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, so our program today is in two parts. The first is uh, I'm going to discuss the exhibition that is currently on view at the Seaport Museum on Fulton Street downtown called Alfred Siegel's New York. Um, the exhibition is accompanied by a beautiful catalog, and I am shamelessly advertising it on the screen there, um, published by Skira Rizzoli. Um, it is the first time that Stieglitz's New York photographs have been assembled since 1932 when Stieglitz showed them in his own Midtown Gallery in American Place, and it's therefore something of a landmark uh, in both this show and the book, uh, thanks to fantastic colleagues at the museum and at Rizzoli, um, did an amazing job. And I have to say, in the 25 years that I've worked as a curator, I've never been as proud of a project as I am of this one, so. Uh, the second as part of our program will be to show a film, Everybody's Street, which was commissioned by the Seaport Museum on the occasion of the exhibition. Cheryl Dunn, who is a filmmaker, is right now on her bike going to my house getting the DVD, which I didn't realize I was supposed to bring. Um, she just came back from a shoot in South Africa, <laughs> and I didn't advertise her as being here because I wasn't sure she was going to be here. I thought she might be in Africa, but instead she's not here at this moment because she's on her way back and forth to Tribeca to get the DVD. But I'm going to talk for half an hour. By that time, she'll be back, and you'll get to see the film. Uh, Cheryl began her career shooting music and fashion magazine for fashion magazines and in the late 1990s she began making documentary films about artists. Um, Everybody Street, as I said, was inspired by the fact that in his early career Stieglitz advocated using a handheld camera to photograph in the streets of New York in his day a radical idea. 
The film provided Cheryl with the opportunity to make a film about, uh, the, the, the project, the show rather, provided Cheryl with the opportunity to make a film about photographers who have devoted themselves to this enterprise. After the film, um, we hope to have a lively question and answer period, I hope, but the, my talk's a half an hour, the film's a half hour. And uh, when I started to work on this project two years ago, I kept wondering what a show about one of traditional photography's patriarchs would offer today's students who work digitally and in color for the most part. In this presentation, <coughs> I hope that this presentation will teach new things about a supreme egotist who was also a very great artist, and I hope it will inspire you, as Charles said, to go uh, see the show at the Seaport Museum. Cheryl's film, which deals with photographers who are known to most students but work very differently for, uh, for most younger photographers, uh, will, I hope, have questions and comments about, uh, the, inspired by the film. Stieglitz's story is complicated. He was and is equally famous as a photographer and as a promoter of modern art in America, and the two stories are intricately intertwined. For the current exhibition at the Seaport Museum, we tried to capture this complex interaction on many levels. For example, the rooms in which Stieglitz's photographs hang suggest the appearance of his New York galleries. This is an, uh, an installation shot from the exhibition that's on view now, and this is an installation shot from Stieglitz's gallery 291 that was at Fifth Avenue and 30th Street between 1905 and 1917. To complicate things further, Stieglitz focuses as much on portraiture and landscape as on the city. There's one constant, however, in all of his work that was best stated by the painter Georgia O'Keeffe, who was Stieglitz's second wife. O'Keeffe famously remarked, I never knew him to make a trip anywhere to photograph. He was always photographing himself. So here is the somewhat paradoxical crux of the matter. Stieglitz was a New Yorker. And during his lifetime, New York came of age as the 20th century city. Born during the Civil War, he grew up on East 60th Street between Fifth Avenue and Madison Avenue, which was so far uptown at the time that goats occupied the empty lots across the street. By the time he died, just after World War II, New York's skyscrapers, mass transit, crowds, advertising, and jazz clubs had come to define modernity. This giant size subject suited his giant size ego, but Stieglitz was not an urban explorer. He never went very far from home. His photographs of New York capture an intensely personal response to a symbolically rich subject. Born in Hoboken, New Jersey in 1864, Alfred was the eldest of six children of Edward and Hedwig Stieglitz, German Jewish immigrants who had left Europe in the wake of the revolutionary unrest of 1848. Edward made a fortune providing dry goods to Chicagoans in the wake of the catastrophic fire of 1871, and the following year, when Alfred was eight, he moved the family into a newly built Manhattan townhouse. As a teenager, Alfred was sent to Germany to complete his education, and it was there that he discovered photography in its te technical and artistic aspects. Although his parents' favorite, although his parents' favorite child, Stieglitz stretched their patience to the limit, remaining in Europe for 10 years, refining his craft, absorbing European culture, and fathering an illegitimate child. Only the death and childbirth of his sister Flora brought him home in 1890 when he was 26. Chastened, he allowed his father to set him up in a photo engraving business, and he married a socially appropriate girl, Emmeline Obermeyer, called Emmy, who was the youngest sister of his best friend and whose parents owned a lucrative Brooklyn brewery. Disoriented and bored with his job, he poured his energies into the Society of Amateur Photographers of New York, where his Jewish background and European sophistication marked him as an outsider. At first, he found New York coarse and foreign compared to Europe, but soon he changed his mind, embracing the city's vitality and claiming it as his primary photographic subject. In the 1890s, Stieglitz pioneered the artistic use of the handheld camera, a cumbersome machine with a 4 by 5 inch negative that allowed him to record motion in the streets. Most of his celebrated photographs of this period were taken very near either his home, his office, or the camera club, which is defied by this picture. No one knows exactly uh, where he is, or who, and no one knows who took it. Uh, it's been uh, 
you know, this is not near his home, his office, or a camera club. It's on one of the new bridges, probably the Manhattan Bridge, but or the Williamsburg Bridge, but nobody knows for sure. So, so much for historical generalization. Um, I just love the picture because you get a sense of his body language and the heft of his camera. <laughs> uh, on February 22nd, 18, okay, the next picture, which is uh, Winter Fifth Avenue. On February 22nd, 1893, Stieglitz walked out of the headquarters of the Photographic Society, at Fifth, who's, which at that time was at Fifth Avenue and 38th Street, into a raging snowstorm and waited three hours to capture this image, Winter Fifth Avenue. Stieglitz promoted this prize-winning photograph, repeatedly submitting it to competitions and publishing it 25 times before 1900. In an 1897 article on, called The Hand Camera, Its Present Importance, Stieglitz recounted that when he showed the negative to his colleagues at the society, they smiled and advised him to, to throw away such rot because it was not sharp. But when they saw the finished print, the laugh was on the other side. With work such as this, Stieglitz established a specialty in photographing everyday subjects in inclement weather with a camera considered little more than a toy. A comparison of the 1890s carbon print, the one you just saw, lushly printed on textured watercolor paper with a 1930s contact print on silver gelatin paper demonstrates Stieglitz's claim in that early article that he considered his early negatives only a point of departure for cropping and enlargement. In this case, the image was cropped vertically to focus entirely on the horse-drawn coach and its driver braving the elements, equating the driver's fortitude with the photographer's. And just to compare them one more time, you can see what he's up to. Stieglitz recalled photographing the terminal the day after he photographed Winter Fifth Avenue. Leaving his Leonard Street office, he walked a few blocks south to the main post office next to City Hall Park, where the Third Avenue streetcar line turned around to head uptown toward Harlem. Facing Astor House, he photographed the trolley man in his rubber raincoat washing down his horses as steam rose from their overheated bodies in the cold air. Like Winter Fifth Avenue, this photograph was a technical tour de force, but it did not garner much praise at the time. Not until years later did Stieglitz consider the terminal one of his most important early works. He came to associate the deep feeling he experienced taking the photograph with beginning to feel at home after spending 10 years in Europe. America was safe for me, I was no longer alone. In both of these works, one heavily promoted at the time, the other reimagined years later, Stieglitz pushed the technical boundaries of the medium, photographing in difficult conditions and capturing ephemeral effects in order to elevate ordinary street subjects to the status of works of art. He sought subjects, the coach driver battling the elements and the trolley driver caring for his tired animals, that expressed his feelings of separation from and yearning for connection to his environment. At the turn of the century, Stieglitz took many photographs in or around Madison Square, then the center of fashionable New York. The subjects of these photographs were often topical, such as spring showers, the street cleaner, which portrays one of the white wings, a cleaning brigade that had recently been formed to improve city sanitation. The style of the photograph was equally up to date. Painters, printmakers, and popular illustrators were enamored of the idea that New York, with its buildings of unprecedented height and its overcrowded streets, might be considered picturesque, an aesthetic previously reserved for ancient ruins and meandering gardens. These artists rendered New York picturesque by shrouding the streets in rain, snow, or darkness an approach that had already preoccupied Stieglitz for several years. In this example, the French-trained child Hassam painted the same side of Madison Square Park that Stieglitz photographed. Notice that they both planted, uh, they both, the both, in both works, the freshly planted trees protected by fences. See these little, whoops, these are the same little trees. Thank <laughs> you.
Although Stieglitz was actively following the news stories and artistic trends of the moment, as usual, he did not stray very far to take these photographs. Madison Square was only a short walk from the Camera Club of New York on 30th Street near Fifth Avenue, where he was spending most of his time as editor of its, of its journal, Camera Notes. Another picturesque version of a topical Madison Square location is the Flatiron of 1903. This building, which filled the oddly shaped intersection at Broadway Fifth Avenue and <clears throat> 23rd Street, was one of the city's then tallest building, uh, with one of the city's then tallest buildings, was lampooned in the press as a hideous blemish on a prestigious neighborhood. Shortly after the building's completion in 1902, Stieglitz entered the Flatiron debate by publishing an article and a poem praising the building in his new journal, Camera Work. In the same issue, he published his version of the building, rendering it picturesque in the manner of a Whistler etching. A comparison of Stieglitz's picturesque flatiron with that of his young protege, Edward Steichen, highlights Stieglitz's peculiar urban sensibility. Stieglitz photographed the building uh, from inside Madison Square Park on a snowy day, cropping the image vertically. This is the Stieglitz version. Stieglitz photographed the building from inside Madison Square on a snowy day, cropping the image vertically to eliminate pedestrians and create a feeling of melancholy isolation. Steichen photographed the building from the front of the Fifth Avenue Hotel, filling the foreground with the shiny reflection of electric lights on rain-slick streets and the elegant silhouette of a top-hatted handsome cab driver. While Steichen captured the glamour and excitement of the neighborhood, Stieglitz transformed one of the city's busiest, noisiest locales into a pastoral idol. In the following few years, Stieglitz was very busy organizing groundbreaking exhibitions of photography and modern art at his gallery at 291 Fifth Avenue and publishing camera work. As a result, he had very little time for his own photography. As he spent the summer of 1910 organizing a huge exhibition of pictorial photographs for the Albright Art Gallery in Buffalo, Stieglitz felt the need to produce new work of his own to include in this show. In recent years, younger photographers within his circle had begun to photograph New York. Alvin Langdon Coburn for one, and Carl Struess for another. And he also felt a pressure to reassert his hold on this subject. Like them, he focused on the harbor with its new bridges and skyline suddenly dominated by Wall Street skyscrapers. This radical development in Lower Manhattan was much debated in the popular press, with writers searching for metaphors to characterize the new commercial architecture. The most dramatic of Stieglitz's harbor scenes, The City of Ambition, overly, overtly engages this debate. Once again, however, Stieglitz had not sought out a controversial subject, but stumbled upon it, this time while traveling by ferry weekly to visit Emmy and their daughter Kitty, who were spending the summer at a resort in Deal, New Jersey. It was this series of photographs, by the way, that inspired the Seaport Museum to embark on the current exhibition. But in my opinion, many of these works are Stieglitz's least personal and most formulaic. The City of Ambition, for example, readily compares with the harbor sketches of Joseph Pinnell, a prolific and conventional architectural illustrator. The Buffalo exhibition was Stieglitz's swan song to pictorial photography, and for a variety of principled and petty reasons, he broke off relations with almost all of his photography colleagues in its aftermath. At his gallery and in his journal, he concentrated almost exclusively on showcasing modern art, giving Picasso, Matisse, Cezanne, Brancusi, and other European avant-garde artists their first exhibition in America, as well as introducing a stable of French-trained Americans like John Marin and Marston Hartley. Uh, the, uh, the landmark Armory Show of 1913 that introduced European modern art to a broad American public usurped Stieglitz's vanguard position, but he remained center stage as this dramatic story unfolded. And just to, as points to illustrate that, that what I just, the story I just told you, this is a um, Picasso drawing that Stieglitz purchased out of an exhibition that, uh, that he held at 291, 
which he later lent to the armory show. So it, it's, a, it's a work that sort of resonates historically. And then this is just an example of a, of a Marin watercolor of the city um, made around 1915. Uh, Cuba's influence, clearly. In 1914, as the gallery increasingly claimed to define his, his life, Stieglitz began a series of portraits of his circle of artists and colleagues, which he called the Men of 291. And this example is a 1915 um, print of Francis Picabia. Putting aside the handheld camera for the 8 by 10 inch camera on a tripod, he posed his subjects and included fragments of the gallery and its works of art within the frame. Perhaps realizing that the achievement of 291 was nearing completion, Stieglitz also began to compose installation views, which recorded not specific exhibitions, but composites of exhibitions that were shown there. And this is a particularly wonderful one, uh, which includes this sort of signature brass bowl, which was in many of the uh, 291 sh shows and kind of represents um, actually kind of represents a tradition of a sort of uh, the continuity of the sort of arts and crafts uh, aesthetic that the gallery opened with in 1905 and sort of modernist, more modernist uh, aesthetic that it, that it evolved towards, as well as uh, Picasso, uh, uh, Picasso um, prints and an African mask and a wasp's nest, um, all sort of representing the aesthetic uh, cauldron that 291 came to represent. Um, <clears throat> so it's a symbolic picture, in other words, um, not a documentary one. Um, at the same time, Stieglitz turned outward and began photographing New York from the gallery's back window. <clears throat> Looking east and north toward Madison Avenue, from his fourth floor perch, he saw a jumble of backyards, fire escapes, hanging laundry, and ordinary office buildings. And working at dawn and at night and in the snow when the city appeared uninhabited, he made 20 views from this back window. Yay, Cheryl's here with me. <laughs> Thank you, that was amazing. Um, these are uh, part of this series of 20 views. We have three of them in the exhibition, which we borrowed from Williams College. This was a great coup. I felt to get three that had the same provenance. This is uh, in the snow. And this is my favorite one that's at night. <coughs> Joel Smith, the curator of photographs at the Princeton University Art Museum, who actually wrote his PhD dissertation <coughs> on Stieglitz's New York pictures, has speculated that these window views are Stieglitz's response to the men of 291 portraits, that they were, in essence, self-portraits. It is often said that the major inspiration for Stieglitz's backyard views were the recent New York photographs of the young Paul Strand, whose, whom Stieglitz chose as his photographic heir and to whom he dedicated the last two issues of camera work, and this is his most famous New York picture, Wall Street, from 1915 that was published in Camera Work in 1917. It is true that the back window photographs demonstrate, like Strand's work, a new sensitivity to the compositional lessons of Cubism. But I find Smith's thesis much more interesting. By turning his portrait camera from the place that defined his life toward the city, Stieglitz found the ideal balance between his inner and outer worlds. He discovered, finally, his New York. In 1917, when Stieglitz was 53 years old, his life crumbled and just as quickly began anew. The United States entered the Great War fighting against his own Germany. Camera work in 291, which had experienced financial difficulties for several years, came to an end. The next year, he left Emmy, his wife of 25 years, <clears throat> to live with George O'Keefe, a young artist from Texas. From 1918 to 1925, with his family providing modest support, and with no gallery to run, and with O'Keefe as his muse, Stieglitz was more productive than ever before. During these years, however, he did not photograph New York. 
O'Keefe preferred the country to the city, and Stieglitz was stunned by the vulgarity and commercialism of Jazz Age New York. He produced two bodies of work, a serial portrait of O'Keefe and a series of landscapes that evolved into photographs of cloud formations, which he made during the summer at his family's home on Lake George. And I'm just to signify this whole shift in his work, I'm just showing two of the O'Keefe serial portrait. When he showed some of the new photographs in 1921, he announced in the catalog, <laughs> I was born in Hoboken. I am an American. Notably absent was mention of his New York roots. In 1925, Stieglitz and O'Keefe moved into an upper floor apartment in the Shelton Hotel on Lexington Avenue between 48th and 49th Streets, the tallest residential building in the world at that time. Their novel decision literally changed their perspective on the city. To his friend Sherwood Anderson, Stieglitz wrote, we live high up in the Shelton Hotel. The wind howls and shakes the huge steel frame. We live as if we were out at mid-ocean. It's a wonderful place. That same year, Stieglitz opened the Intimate Gallery, a top floor room in a midtown auction house. When it closed in 1929, his friends and family leased five rooms on the 17th floor of a new office building at Madison Avenue and 53rd Street, which became the gallery an American place. Stieglitz divided his time between the gallery and the Shelton, and in the spring of 1930, he began photographing from the windows at both locations, developing the picture-making strategy he had used 15 years earlier at 291. The stimulus for Stieglitz's new photography was the construction of new buildings near his home and his work. The decade's building boom had been explosive, and despite the onset of the Depression, it did not immediately slow. Once Stieglitz settled on particular view, he made several variations, using different lenses and photographing at different times of day. When construction of a building finished, he would end his series, and I'm just going to show you a couple of... We have in the uh, exhibition examples from each of these series, um, <clears throat> uh, I guess three from An American Place and, three, and four from the Shelton Hotel, and I'm just going to give you a couple of examples. Uh, this is the view looking southwest from An American Place. He's looking toward uh, the construction of Rockefeller Center, which was, of course, the most enduring construction project during the Depression because the financing came from the Rockefellers' personal fortune and not from any kind of bank loan. Um, so, uh, let's see here, I have to look at these. Uh, this is the same view uh, taken either at dusk or at dawn uh, and with a different lens which completely changes the um, relationships um, the, you know, the formal relationships, the geometric relationships of parts, and completely throws into shadow the most striking uh, peculiarity of this first image, which is uh, the concrete, the cracking concrete on the side of the neighboring building. And then uh, a year later, when the building at Rockefeller Center is completed, he goes back to finish the series and includes the water tower at the top to create yet a different variation on theme. And then I'm just gonna give you an example of one of the Shelton series. Um, this is looking north from the Shelton. Uh, right here, the, oh, sorry, whoops. Okay, uh, this is the Waldorf Astoria before the tower starts, which is right where they live. I think you can see there's actually like tape on the windows that still ha the building hasn't been opened yet. The building of the Walder Pastoria, which is a whole city block long, was right outside their window for a couple of years. Um, and then this building here is was for many years the GE Tower when it started. It was supposed to be the RCA Tower. RCA moved to Rockefeller Center and it became the GE Tower. And I'm, it's something else now, but for all the time, most of my years in New York, it's always been the GE Tower. Um, and then back in here, there's a building in construction. This is, uh, which uh, is actually across the street from an American place. Uh, and, and the series shows this building rising. This is another view, obviously, with another lens to show the top of the GE Tower. And you can see that 
this construction is working apace. And then here's this bill, with, again, with a long lens that foreshortens everything. And that tower next to an American place a few blocks away is coming along. <laughs> and then this is another view from the series. So these uh, variations on a theme are what is um, preoccupying him. <coughs> Viewing the city from on high, Stieglitz manipulated the forms of buildings and recorded their growth as if, as if the buildings were organic forms. These late photographs are the meditations of an old man who was no longer part of the activity below. In 1932, at an American place, he showed a selection of the new photographs along with what he called the Old New York series, a retrospective of his New York work. Despite its air of finality, O'Keefe loved the exhibition. To her friend Dorothy Brett, she wrote, the place is the most beautiful now that it has been at all. The rooms as a whole are more severe, more clear in feeling, and each print as you walk down the length of each wall is as if a breath is caught. I am glad he is showing them, but there is something about it all that makes me very sad. His health failing, Stieglitz stopped photographing in 1935, but continued to work daily at an American place until 1946, when he died at age 82. I hope now that the basic paradox of Stieglitz's New York photographs is more apparent. Although he began as a pioneer street photographer, in the end he wasn't truly a street photographer at all. His photographs were, as O'Keefe so clearly stated, always about himself, and it was the window view, which he discovered in 1916 and developed in the 1930s, a mediated space between inner and outer worlds that best expressed his vision of New York. The window view, as art history students know, is a common trope of romantic art, and indeed, for all his modernist credentials, Stieglitz was a romantic in the 19th century European sense of the word. Okay. So that's my thesis um, on Stieglitz that you'll, that's in the book, and, and the exhibition you know, gives you a really rare opportunity to see these prints. I have to tell you, just in terms of museum politics, this was a great accomplishment. <laughs> Um, to borrow, uh, if, if for any of you who may know any of this backstory, when Stieglitz died, O'Keefe spent about three years of her life organizing his estate and depositing his sets of his prints in about a dozen major art museums. And she also put a stipulation on them that they couldn't be lent without her permission. And a few years ago, with after. Uh, that provision was challenged in court, and so it was then uh, thereafter possible legally to borrow Stieglitz prints. However, <laughs> there is a long tradition of it being very difficult to extract these images, these, these prints from museums, especially for the South Street Seaport Museum, which is a history museum that does not have anything in its collections that the Matt, MoMA, the Philadelphia Museum, the Chicago Art Institute, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, et cetera, would particularly want to borrow reciprocally. So it was an enormous effort on the part of myself and uh, the staff of the museum to gain their trust, uh, both that the conditions at the museum were appropriate um, and that the project was worthy of their lending. And so, uh, and I have to say, as I said, I'm very proud of the result. I do feel that the result is worthy um, of the special extra effort. I mean, Stieglitz was very, very suspicious of reproduction of photographs and really believed that the originals needed to be seen. And I do feel that this exhibition, for example, the room we have that is modeled on an American place and uh, how it represents all those series of the sh from the Shelton and from an American place does capture that feeling that O'Keefe described of the sort of severe severity and sadness and sort of intelligence of that work, um, as well as the earlier uh, room, the work with the earlier room that's meant that, that suggests the appearance and feeling of 291. So I, I, I do want to encourage you to actually go and see it. Um, it, it is, it, I, for some of you, I hope it would provide kind of special, you know, museum experience. So we have this film, Cheryl. <laughs> Me? 
It's up till January 10th. January, January 10th, it's up to. Okay. So now we have this incredible film called Everybody Street, which was actually commissioned for the show. And uh, I, you weren't here. Cheryl, please just, you know, you'll introduce yourself after for question and answer. But um, are we set to go here? Did you give them the thing? Okay. first thing that I remember was, I was 10 years old, and a friend of mine came by, Sammy, Sammy Nichols, and he said, you want to see developing in my basement? And I said, what's that? He said, come along. So I, I went with Sammy into this dark, dank, Midwestern basement with a ruby light, and he put, exposed something and to light, and then stuck a piece of paper into a tray, enamel tray of water, what I thought was water, and an image appeared. And that really affected me. And, but that passion of an image coming out of nothing uh, is still, when I'm in my dark room making my own prints, the same passion, same magic appears. It was pretty much all, always my, my practice to offer pictures. And even in the Brooklyn Gang, I would give them pictures. And it was a way of seeing them, and, for, and a way of them seeing me. And so I was able to be invisible almost to them, because they were secure with me being around with my camera. Uh, because they were very depressed, and they were very angry, and they were very poor, and there was nothing for them in, in that community. And I wasn't there to um, judge them. It was about these kids, who were like any kids, unattended to. I supported myself by, by a little bit of commercial work, you know. I started doing fashion, but I didn't have any feeling for fashion, and the models were much too tall for me. So I, I, after a while I gave that up because I went down on a freedom ride. So I switched from doing fashion to photographing the civil rights movement. I didn't, I didn't do any fashion after that. I couldn't come to terms or to grips with the fact that I was photographing poverty in the South and there was a model standing underneath a, a waterfall, you know, in a costume. So I lived in, like a monk. I had a mattress on the floor, a chip, dying triple airplane, a dark kitchen combination where I could eat uh, frozen Hershey bars and chicken uh, while I printed, you know. I read a lot of uh, books on tiger hunts and I scheduled my, the way I would be on a subway, the same way a tiger hunter would walk across a field with a tiger, trailing him from the back. And uh, so I, I was always aware that I might be attacked from the rear on the subway. And actually, I was. <laughs> but also, the subway was sexy. You know, I had a little love affairs for 10 seconds with women on the train, you know, and never see them again. So I, I could run a kind of a dialogue of fantasy in the subway. It could be anything to me. And then 100th Street in the early 50s was considered the worst block in the city. 
in terms of housing and the way people lived and survived and thrived and raised their families and try to keep their place really nice, you know. So while I didn't have any agenda, they just felt good that someone wanted to see them. Yeah. And, and that's, that happens a lot with various bodies of work in mind where people are glad you're there to see them. There's no one's paying attention. loved from the beginning. I loved the street. And I still love the street and I still go out on the street. It's a challenge to work on the street. And, and, and it's hard. I think it's the hardest photography to do is street photography because you have to really think on your feet. You have to make a picture in that very moment. And I'm old school in the sense, well I'm an analog photographer, but I'm old school in the sense that I, that I don't believe in cropping. Because I believe you have to make the picture in, in the camera. I think often your subject matter can show you what the picture is, it makes it for you. So I'm not a strong believer in heavy duty concepts when I do portraits of people. I sort of like it to come from the people. I, I try and make, make iconic images, that's my, they're hard to make, but that's my goal, is to make images that stand on their own. That, that's what I try and do. Not to tell a particular story, I think a film tells a story. Yeah. Still pictures should be single, very powerful images, and I've always felt that way. I think it's harder to be a woman than a man, I'll definitely admit that. But I think there's a, also an advantage to being a female as a photographer, if you're a street photographer or like a, a documentary photographer, because I can walk down the street and I can knock on a door and someone will let me in. I, I'm less threatening than, than a man. I have no regrets. Uh, given given uh, the opportunity to do something differently, to start again, I would still go in that direction. I love you know, photographs about, about humans, or animals, I love animals too, but you know, or humans and animals. But I think that the art world, you know, they're always thinking in, in terms of decoration, and those kind of strong images aren't as decorative. And, and it's too bad, because my favorite photographs, and I think historically the pictures that I love, are the photographs that are about reality. Whether it's portraiture or, or street shooting or whatever, they're all about reality. I just knew I had to be out there watching life because I was interested in the way you know, people did things. It seemed to me that's what you photographed, the, the instantaneous gesture when somebody made some kind of emotion or did, did something physical. So Robert Frank chopped this job for me and in Stuyvesant Town and it was so interesting. I had never seen a real photographer work. I'd seen fashion photographers, but never a real photographer. And he just was so physical, and he moved so agilely, and he was balletic, and, and he kind of whispered to the girls as he was photographing them. And I, I just saw something I had never seen before, which is, you can move and take photographs at the same time. You don't have to say, hold that pose, lift your head, turn it. I mean, he just moved with them. And I left that shoot two hours later went out on the street, and suddenly everything on the street was alive to me. Someone waving for a taxi, two people hugging goodbye, you know, a mother pulling a kid across the street. 
And I, I, I saw this thing click, click, click in my mind. And by the time I got back to my office, which was on 53rd and 5th Avenue, I knew I had to leave. I walked into my office. The art director said, how'd the, sh how'd the shoot go? And I said, it was great. I'm quitting. And, and he said, why? What are you going to do? I said, I want to be a photographer. And I remember he asked me the crucial question. He said, do you have a camera? How are you going to make pictures? And the camera he said, opened his drawer and he handed me his camera, Pentax, and he said, "Here, use this until you get a camera." So that, for me, was the beginning, and it was on pure impulse that somebody transformed everyday life into an art form, a physical, visual art form. I, I think that part of what you love when you're a street photographer is this kind of sensibility that develops where you think you understand something about not only the person you're photographing or the group you're photographing, but the culture at large becomes uh, aware. You know, it enters your awareness or you enters your, your sensitivity. And, and some sense of exchange that only I can identify with them in this way because I'm me. And in a sense, they help, in an aggregate way, make you, the artist, more of yourself. And I think it's what all photographers love about the medium, is something happens, some personal thing happens. Even though it's a machine, and even though it uses a fraction of a second of time, we learn, as human beings, how to understand minute little exchanges. <laughs> showed me his little book of drawings, and that's how I got into graffiti. So if you look at uh, the book that I did with Henry Chalfant, it looks as if every car was covered with this beautiful graffiti. But in fact, you could go and stand for five hours and never even get one. I mean, I would wake up before dawn in the winter when it was cold and go up to the Bronx and stand in a vacant lot for hours just waiting for the train to come by, and sometimes nothing would come by. And for me, it was always a matter of getting the right background with the right train. I think anything that's ephemeral is like wonderful subject matter for a still photograph, whether it's street art or graffiti or a little go-kart that a kid has made. You know it's not going to be around for long. And in just you know less than a second, you can take a picture and preserve it. It's, it's sort of historic preservation. And bottom line is, you've captured something that actually might be of interest in the future. And that's the kind of thing I'm looking for. When I go out on the street, and it, it's a lot of fun for me. <laughs> and I don't like to think, oh, this has to, you know, I'm not going to take it because the light isn't right.
nobody really thought about style in photography for much of the 19th century. And it's not until the 18, late 1880s, really, you get Stieglitz and Emerson and um, various other people in, in Britain as well as the United States and um, in France, to de Machy, and you know, you get all this gum bichromate and photographs that look like they're lithographs and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then and this, this trickles down to art photography, all the magazines, and soon you have dentists in Syasa taking pictures of trees at sunset that look Japanese. And, um, and then, meanwhile, there's been, all along, there's been this great documentary photography um, that, um, you know, passed unnoticed at the time. And I'm thinking New York City photography, the first person I think of is Helen Levitt. Helen was um, involved with the Photo League. That was her first real contact with other photographers before she met Evans, etc. And um, and there were a lot of these, you know, sort of citizen photographers who come out of the Bronx and whatever. What would you describe a key element, the key element in a good street photograph? Um, openness, open-endedness. Um, refusal to produce a punchline, um, refusal to judge. And I just really wonder, I mean, what is there out there that we haven't seen? And we'll be rediscovering archives for centuries, assuming the world lasts that long, but, you know, I mean, with New York City street photography, I can expect that um, there'll be things being unearthed gradually over time. basically was known as a street photographer. And when I was growing up in Brooklyn, in Williamsburg, I used to look out my second story window at the, you know, vigorous or whatever, street lights down below, and I was hooked. And also television had a lot to do. You know, because um, I like film noir, and I like shadows, and I like to use flash, and I like strong images. And I, had, I realized I had to really jump in people's faces because to isolate them, because to, separate the foreground from the background. And also, I was noticing that, you know, the sunshade, sunshade, it didn't really work for me, you know, the way I wanted. So that's how I came to get my kind of pictures. Flash helps me visualize my feelings of the city, which it does because it shows the stress, the energy, the speed, and the anxiety of the people, you know? Those are good apples, so, on a street level. So um, I was able to jump at people at the right angle, put the light there. I mean, if, if people are moving, you have to be fast, or you have to have a plan. You're not trying to be invisible. No. I'm not trying to be flashy. I mean, I'm not bells and whistles, but, you know, you can be invisible and be very close, because sometimes I work so close that people don't realize I'm taking their picture. And they look behind them, you know, to see, like, who they take a picture of. When you work in the street like I do, and you have to make snap judgments, you know, you can't photograph everybody, you can't photograph every situation, because otherwise I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you, even though I have gotten into altercations, I've gotten into arguments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, that's not the idea of being a street photographer, okay? I gotta have soundtrack as I walk in the streets. Now I really need it because my neighborhood has been infested by New Jack Cornwalls. I met this weird, crazy, uh, crazy dress girl at Danceteria in 83, May of 83, right off the bat. I was like, oh shit, yo, let me, get your pic let me take your picture, like a couple in the booth. Or I saw two interesting people, I'd be like, yo, can we come together for one quick shot? So. Anyway, it basically just, 
I took to it like the easy, naturally, knack. And people had were receptive to me. But I never took it seriously. It was just something I did with her. You know, I wasn't into arts. I was into playing ball. After 84, that fall, she kind of started changing. She dissed me for some fucking scrub who wore tie-dye yoga pants. And I was fucking humiliated, insulted, furious. She played me like a soggy cannoli. So I took the, she had left some shit at my house, and one of the things was a little camera. A Minolta autofocus, Hymatic. I said, I'm gonna take this camera, and I'm gonna fucking become something where she fucking gonna be mad sorry she dissed me like this. So, spring of 85, early, like March, I declared, I'm gonna take pictures. I'm gonna take pictures. What was your first job in photography? Good question. Oh, shit. That's a good-ass question. Well, my first gig was with East, the East Village Eye. This is from 85. I think my first picture published was Keith Haring and Futura 2000. And when I saw my photo credit next to it, the Rickster, I was like, oh, wow. And I got down with uh, Paper Magazine as well at that time. It was my first press pass from Paper. Did you still work? Yeah, I definitely still rock these. I'm like, no, I'm from Paper Magazine. Yeah, I've been a messenger, substitute school teacher, frozen lemonade vendor, <laughs> tour photographer. Um, my most well-known photo, probably Warhol Basquiat. The yeah, yeah. My neighborhood, like I said, is full of fucking New Jack, anti jerk off, cornwall motherfuckers. But I have to be prepared because even a dope shot might arise, even when I just go to the deli. And it happens. Which, you know, there was no reason I shouldn't have a camera because all I had to do was this. And if you can't do this, if this is too much, then, you know, I was in the wrong business. I was pretty much born into photography. My father was a professional photographer. In 1977, I joined the movie. The importance of documenting your life, the importance of learning how to play chess. And I became a big brother to a lot of people. So it wasn't really about the photography. The photography was evidence of my conversation with my subjects. Because the, the street was my studio. You know, every street corner, I mean, I, I mastered knowing where all the brick walls was at, the gates, how the light fell. And it's, it's always spon uh, spontaneous. You never know when you're going to get a shot. So I was happy with that. So, you know, kids knew that I was downtown Brooklyn. They knew I was on 42nd Street. They knew I would be around the Lansing Street. I saw the build up a reputation where, you know, there was certain areas that I was always at and didn't get a moment. Friday and Saturday was 42nd Street. So you going there was a nucleus for the whole of the city. Everyone was there. Everybody got dapped and went there. So I knew that was the place to be. So I was standing on the corner of 7th Avenue and 42nd Street all night long, just docking. But when the trains came in, people came off. And I was just shooting. Common thread is it's just a piece of a puzzle of my life. You know, for me, it's seconds of my life. That's the umbrella of all my work. Seconds of my life. That's that's the, 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 the common denominator. Every photograph here represents a second of my, of my life. thing I did consistently and all the time in terms of the street was photograph people in front of my door. Now if you look at the Lower East Side, it was almost impossible in those days to go around with a camera and just shoot all the people on the street corners because it was, without question, this was one of the most uh, uh, heavily uh, active
drug economies in the world. So you couldn't really go around and photograph people on the street. It just would be a very dangerous thing to do. Maybe one or two or whatever, a small group you get to know. But by photographing in front of my door and then putting the pictures in the window and making these people famous, I eventually photographed the whole neighborhood. And a lot of the people that are in the pictures are the people that are on the streets, a lot of the drug sellers, you know, the gangs, the bad guys, the good guys, the people in like the Latin Kings, the Eta, La Familia, the Boat Mafia, the Bloods, the Crips, because they all wanted to be in the window in this wall of fame. So eventually I have photographs of an inner city street, you know, a lot of people that maintain the streets from 14th Street to the Brooklyn Bridge, which is huge, which is huge. And I think at a certain level too, I think because of what I photographed and a lot of what I've done, some of it appears to be antisocial because it was like competition with the police and like that, and they got cops in trouble for doing it. But in reality, it's not that it's antisocial, it's interested in the social factor that most people try to overlook. And that's part of, like, part of the reason of coming to New York. Why did I come to New York? Because I wanted to have what I did become relevant and significant. Although I do think of uh, uh, pictures that I take now, I take a lot of sort of mundane pictures because I like to think of them as seen from 100 years from now. And that's like, you know, Atje or, or, or Stieglitz and like that, looking at some of those pictures, it's, it's the 100 year factor that I find really to be fascinating. So I think of my photography in, in multiple ways. I think of it as uh, keeping things for the future and sort of preserving this moment now for then. I think of it as an activist tool. I think of it as something that uh, can give you access to places where you could never be before. And you're living in your own world. So you're kind of in your own world there doing your thing. And so it's good for that. So I moved to New York in 1978, so coming to the city, uh, I immediately fell in love with the energy and all that it's made up of, but I think I, I had for my own self a certain kind of advantage, or, or a tool, let's say a tool, to use, and that is I did not grow up in the city at all. So I bring, I bring with me a, uh, a different kind of a sponge. I really immediately fell in love with color. And uh, I just couldn't help myself. There was something that I, I even at that time, I was referring to color like M&Ms, like candy. And when I saw those uh, prints come up, either extra colors or cibachromes out of a drum, a young corkum, and you'd see the, the colors, I, 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 just, I just couldn't help myself. I always felt, I always felt color. I seen color, I photographed in color. And you know, one, one of the explanations or definitions one might have when they say snapshot might be uh, a tilt, you know, that is not straight, that the sun is not in the middle, or it's, it's, something is awry. And I've always liked that, I'm not alone. You don't like to be called a street photographer. I don't mind being called a street photographer. I think there's something, it's just, it's a little bit short. Uh, some of the connotations that I might have are not necessarily positive even. It doesn't even mean anything. You know, what is a street photographer? I just happen to take a lot of photographs, literally on the physicality of the streets, and in my case, in New York. Do you shoot with digital cameras? I have commercially, with help. It's super sized. I get very, very, very scared. So scared. I could never buy enough external hard drives to back me up. You see how I am. I mean, my whole house would have to be an external. And then I'd have to get another house to back up the house. It would never end. No, I'm just crazy about my, you know, my work. You know, I, I, you couldn't back it up. I'm sure you could, but it's very hard for me.
In the summertime, you would just go out, you'd try to go out and get more air, or you, or people would sit on the, sleep on the fire escape, which is a bad idea. Um, and uh, have social, social affairs on the stoop. And the kids would play in the street. I was very diligent about when I was shooting, I would really spend the whole day, but I knew where I was going. I knew where, what area, and I'd really spend time taking photographs there. And there's the one, one photograph where this guy with the hook around his neck. I mean, he, I said to him, you know, you, you look so great. Can I take a photo? He said, sure. And, you know, he still stand there with his car with the baby doll. Yeah, just stood there, you know. And she, Real warm photograph, you know, and I took it. You have to take it before they start getting fi fixed up, you know, or be set up. You just take it fast because it just came naturally that my photographs had a nice spacing and the people, wherever the people or the buildings were, and what I should include and what I shouldn't include. I think Vance must have helped me, you know, we used to study choreography, the space. Space had a lot to do with dance. The space you're making and the space where you're standing on the stage, you know. So that that probably was a big thing, you know, like a lot of Howard Greenberg would say, well, he would say, she just moved the space of the stage onto the street, you know. <laughs> and this is called the choreography of the streets, Rebecca would say. And I think Will there be anybody who's using the photography the way it used to be as time goes on? I just think about that. You know. we have to present for you. I don't know if you have any questions on, I mean, you can see they're unrelated in many ways, but it was really wonderful that um, this film was able to just kind of piggyback on the show on this sort of hook that Stieglitz kind of started out this, uh, this, you know, advocating the idea of street photography, even though, as, you know, I explained, I don't really think that when he truly found him, his way that that was what he was, but... Um, I think this film is a joy. I really think it's so much fun, and I thank Cheryl for it, so I want to get a chance for this audience to hear it. So does anybody have any questions about anything? No? Okay. Really? Okay. Go ahead. Um, I wanted to... Uh, I picked people that use New York City as a major body of work, and I reached out to um, a few others, and these were the people that replied back to me. And I think it's the range. Um, Rebecca Lepkoff's 93, and I think I have someone from every decade. I don't even, Ricky's 40, but there's no one lower than that. I just, I didn't, uh, I mean, I think that this group is, is really well-rounded uh, well and very diverse, and, and it was difficult for me to choose someone that was in their 20s to throw in the mix with Bruce Davidson and Joel. I just couldn't do it, so this is where it stands now. I'm, not, um, I'm gonna continue uh, tr making this into a feature length, so I'm trying to get maybe Robert Frank working on that, but that's kind of how I chose this group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they pretty much, like um, um, Jeff says, you know, he and myself too, I'm a photographer. I, commercially, I, I'm forced to shoot digital, but in my personal work, I shoot film. And I think all of these photographers, I think Ricky shoots, you know, there's different schools. There's the people that 
like he, Ricky Powell, he's such a character, but he documents his experiences or his collision with another character on the street. So his, the medium, how he uses the medium is totally different than Bruce Davidson, who just came out with a three book anthology and went to his darkroom for three years and printed 2,000 pictures himself. You know, he's 86 and then shows 800. So everybody has, and then, then there's other photographers who don't print at all, but they still shoot film. So there's all ranges, but they all come from film. And I think that, I mean, personally, I prefer the look of film, but when you, you know, you, I know that you, you, you just know every bit of a medium and digital photography is a different medium. It's not, it does, I don't, it doesn't replace analog photography, it is something else, you know, so for someone that's in their 80s to learn digital photography, I don't think, I don't think Bruce even is interested in that, and I know this was a, a common comment I heard with a few of them, uh, he told me he was, someone was assigned to photograph him, he's doing a series in Los Angeles, and uh, another photographer came to photograph him photographing for a magazine, and she um, shooting digital and just was just powering, shooting, 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 and it unnerved him. You know, it was like she what she doesn't even think what she's doing. She's not composing anything. She's just like because it's the thought of that every frame is costing you this amount. You know, like it's just a different thing. And then and then editing becomes more of the practice than the actual shooting of it or something. But. Film. Oh. Yeah, they're, it's becoming a lot more expensive because uh, the companies aren't making, you know, the film costs a lot more when you make less of it. The, mm, yeah, they're less, but they're there. There's a lot of photography shooting film stuff. Yeah, for press, it's pretty imperative at this point. But for, I think it really suits um, the editors and clients and ad agencies. It suits them more than it possibly suits the photographer. But it also, as the photographer doing a commercial job, it's not like, here's the Polaroid, and trust me, it's going to be good, and tomorrow I'll show you the film. There's, it's less stressful, you know? They're just like, you decide, you know? So. That's it. Hey. Go to the museum and see Bonnie's show. It's beautiful, really beautiful. <laughs>